your host, Ann Kelly. My guest today for the seventh episode is artist Michael Rohner. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Thanks for having me, Ann. Good to see you. You too. Where are you today? I'm in Berkeley, California by the train tracks. Yes. So you mentioned we might have some trains joining us. Yes. I live on 4th Street. The trains are on 3rd Street and we're on the 3rd Street side of the building. So we might have some guests. And a few went by when we were chatting. So probably yeah. when we're talking about it. It won't happen and we'll have to, I'll have to Splice them in somehow. Splice so Edison trains in, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you got some good, you caught them the dozen or so times they came by. You got yeah. some good uh, footage. So I know Michael from Santa Fe, but he moved out west. Uh, how many years ago did you say? About seven. We came out here at the end of 2013, so just about seven years ago. And you're in Berkeley now, but you were in Oakland for a while. Yeah. We landed in Oakland, did about four years there until we found this space uh, in 2017, and we kind of had to move once we saw it, and we've been here for three years, three years on this weekend. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Berkeley is a pretty sweet spot. I've had the opportunity to, to visit. It's been a few years, mm -hmm. hopefully sooner than later. Um, usually, I get to go out to the Bay Area about once a year. Didn't happen this year. Not on a COVID year. Yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, where do you go when you're out here? Usually San Francisco, specifically because there's this portfolio review that I do for the Art Institute, or mm -hmm. rather, I did it about 10 years in a row. So, mm -hmm. and actually this year, they just were skipping a year. So that actually wasn't at all why I didn't visit, but. Yeah, I found some people, who uh, some shows and opportunities that skipped a year look like the smartest kids in the room right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you are a painter and you're an illustrator. Yeah, I would find your work. Or I would call myself an illustrator primarily. My work is illustrative, as you were pointing out. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and I paint the colors on mostly watercolor these days. Uh, but then sometimes there's spray paint, paint marker. Mm -hmm. um, so the common thread in all my work is uh, a base of illustration. I was actually going to ask about that because it seems like, in terms of painting, more people are using acrylic probably than any other type of paint. A lot of your work felt like watercolor, so I was actually kind of mm -hmm. curious if, if it actually was or if you were kind of watering down the acrylics to, to get that effect or... Yeah, it's watercolor. I just found the watercolor supports my illustrations really well since, for me, like my favorite part are the black lines, and so the watercolor kind of even if you wash heavy over the black lines, once it dries, the black lines stand out. Watercolor is kind of challenging because it's it's kind of unforgiving in that you, mm -hmm. can't, you can't paint over it in the way that you could with oil or acrylic. Sure, sure, sure. And I, I think there's a lot of different ways people use watercolors. Um, I tend not to use them super delicately, especially when I'm trying to get some really dark tones and um, values. So I, I layer over the watercolors and build it up a lot of the time, which tends to be more forgiving. But um, yeah, when you want to do kind of like a wash, then you, you get what you get. To me anyways, that's one of the things that's kind of unique about your work is the, the strong illustrative line work paired with the watercolor. On your Instagram page, you share some of your process sometimes. And when you're looking at the beginning of one of your paintings, it almost mm -hmm. looks like maybe a sketch for a tattoo or something like that. I get that a lot. Do you? Yeah. So, so it's an interesting combination of that strong line work and then the kind of more delicate watercolor. How did yeah. you Yeah. Yeah. I, in my own mind, the way I, I mean, I, I was an illustrator for the longest time, just my own sketchbook. Mm -hmm. And when I wanted to take the plunge or figure out how to make, you know, make it into sellable art or making a living out of it. I really didn't know for a while how to make my my sketchbook drawings anything more than a sketchbook drawing. Um, and so, you know, from there, there was a, a long process of experimentation. I was using markers for a long time and playing with different mediums to see what complemented it well. I found that spray paint worked well, you know, to, uh, in, in the background. And then once I kind of landed on watercolors, it felt, it felt very, it felt compatible and really, complemented what I was trying to do and it kind of gave me I mean I, I use watercolors like markers in a lot of ways the way I chip away at it um, chipping away like um because I, I sometimes use kind of like broader brushed strokes 
mm -hmm. I'm kind of like layering it on, you know, the way you would mark it, just kind of like, yeah. So I, I feel like I came to my own process or my own um, style organically, just trying different things over the years. And, and um, so I honestly, on my own, don't have a lot of perspective around how like common or familiar my style looks, but I hear that it's, when people give me feedback, it's always that it's distinct and it looks like my work. Mm -hmm. That That's a huge thing. That's one of the harder things to do within art make. Like you, you love it, so you do it and you can't help it, but then there's being distinctive and then sometimes it's harder to find that distinctive style and sometimes it finds you naturally, which seems yeah. to be kind of just how it worked out for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, for better, for worse. I, and I don't know if I'm, I don't know. I, I don't know if I should say this or not, but I, I tend to have blinders on. Like there's other artists that I follow that I really like. And I, I have my um, artists that are out there that whose work I admire or historically great artists whose work I has inspired me and I've followed. But for a large part, I kind of keep to myself and, and have blinders on. And I kind of don't want to be influenced too much by what's going on. You know, I know that when you start seeing what's trendy and what's working, it's hard just not to subconsciously want to do that when you're creating something. So in a way I, I try to keep, I almost intentionally keep to my own aesthetic world. Yeah. It's kind of this weird balance where it's, it's you, the more you're looking at kind of the more you're naturally influenced, but then it's mm -hmm. also good to, I think, check in every once in a while and see what else is happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, my background is fine art photography, so I get to see a lot more photography than most people. And sometimes it's really interesting to see these different trends where maybe there's uh, a bunch of guys on different sides of the world kind of exploring the same ideas at the same time. Mm -hmm. So then you start wondering about the whole idea of collective on, you know, collective consciousness. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Just reading some Joseph Campbell and he had a lot you know, a little while back, I forgot which book of his it was, but he had a lot to say about the collective consciousness and how if artists are kind of tapped in, they can, you know, if something feels new from an artist or it's like they're tapping into what's bubbling in the collective consciousness in whatever ways we channel or listen or tap into the muses, I always hope to get the ideas from there and try to keep it unclouded from outside of there. You could also be exploring the same thing as 50 other people, but in your yeah. own unique way. I yeah, mean, what's out there and you want to try to be different, then maybe you're almost moving away from something. Like, I've seen that. I want to do something else. But if you're kind of tapping into what you're own ex experiencing, to me, it feels like you're moving towards something. And I, I, I like that proactive direction versus like, ah, I, I got to be different. I got to, you know, it's in that way, it's not as hard in my opinion, in my experience to feel like I'm doing something at least maybe 50 other people are doing it around the world but at least it's my version of it you know yeah no definitely you definitely are uh, you definitely see work sometimes where it feels like it's different to be different and then yeah sometimes yeah. that works sometimes it doesn't yeah yeah no you can tell when someone's in their own originality and that's intoxicating to me i love that yeah you just can't help but doing it and you're just yeah yeah yeah. yeah and usually it comes with a uh, good conversation on the back end you know if you <laughs> tap into where they're coming from you know it's usually uh something along the lines of what we're talking about when did art become a predominant part of your life i think it always has been in that i was just always drawing or sketching in the corner i have i come from a big family i'm the youngest of four I had three older sisters so they were all always just doing different stuff than i would have been doing so i was kind of in the corner a lot and i was just that was i would occupy myself with sketching and i think Mom said, my mom said when I was a kid and she would take me to restaurants and try to keep me quiet, just hand me some paper and a pen and or pencil, and then I would just be gone. So it's always been part of my repertoire and my kind of my own personal like uh, blankie or something, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in school, if I didn't know how to make friends, I would just sit down and draw and people would start looking at what I was doing and then I'd make friends, you know. So uh, it's always been an important fabric of my life. And then, but I was scared to do it for... I didn't know, I had no idea, like I said, when I, with just being a sketchbook kid and hanging out with people, drawing in the, on a couch or drawing, I don't know, in a bar or at a party. I didn't know how to take the next step. So it wasn't until I got to Santa Fe and I was about 30 that I even began to take the plunge seriously. Seems from my perspective, you, you've 
done a great job. I mean, thank you. With that, you've cultivated this unique style in a way for a number of years, but I follow you on social media and it seems like prior to this year, you were always at various festivals, getting the work out there. And not only were you doing that, but there was also pictures on social media. So if you wanted to know where you were, knew where you were. So from yes. the business perspective to the yes. art making perspective, you've done a great job of that. And then well, another thing, you offer originals as well as reproductions. Yes. Which I think it's smart. Yes. That's important mm -hmm. uh, to me. It helps me. It, it's a big major part component of me being, if not the major component of me being an independent artist and having been an independent artist this whole time is owning my own rights and being able to, you know, my, my pieces take me, you know, some of them will take me 60 hours plus, you know, there's not always an audience for the price that that requires right away. And in the meantime, I still have to make a living. And also many people want to have my work. And, and, and so I, I find it that Having prints as well as originals offers an art experience to, to people of all income groups. And I think that tends to work out for, for me and the buyer. Definitely. I, I mean, yeah. there's kind of that thing with art where, okay, an original artwork just has to cost a certain amount of money. Because like you mm -hmm. said, you put 60 to 80 hours plus into something. Mm -hmm. So you can't sell something like that for no. 50 to 100 bucks, it, you know, as much as that would mm -hmm. be nice and just doesn't actually make sense so to be able to go right. in and um create those reproductions but then sell the original is is um just a really good model i think yeah it's 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 been so necessary and also i because my i don't churn my work out you know i've averaged roughly 12 original pieces a year over the last i don't know decade give or take a few pieces every year and you know, the, the, they most, especially the ones that I spend the longest on, there's a story and experience behind it. You know, I, I put a lot into them and I feel like it would be a crying shame if it was only in one person's viewing room and other people didn't get to experience that story. Sure. Do you usually addition the reproductions or just keep them open? So I have both. Mm -hmm. I do open edition for some of the uh, for some of the smaller prints, and then I'll have a size that's a limited edition. Mm -hmm. um, some people just really want limited edition. In my own, you know, take I I could take it or leave it. Um, but there's there's some people who really want, and some shows also require something like what you bring to be limited edition. Some art shows, so um, I almost do that out of a necessity. But if I had my druthers, it would I could take it or leave it. How how many years have you been doing shows? I mean, that's another thing, yeah. not, not all artists quite get into that. You've been very active in doing various art shows and festivals and, and I mean, yeah. you've, you've been getting the, your, the artwork out there. How long, how it's been, a, I, I think I just wrapped up a decade. Cool. Did about, yeah, I did about a solid 10 year clip before COVID gave me a break. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's kind of nice to be home, honestly, but um, yeah, did a, did a good decade. And I, you know, in the beginning of the whole thing, I didn't even know shows and festivals were an option. You know, and I approached some galleries and to your earlier point about how much time you put in the work versus what you get, you know, when I had no reputation and just barely a step past having a sketchbook, you know, I brought work to various galleries around town when I was in Santa Fe and the ones that were like, hey, we can give you a shot, you know, we'll put a couple pieces in the corner what do you want for them? And I'd say the price I wanted. And they'd say, no, we don't think you can sell for that much. We'll sell for this much. And then they get half of that. Right. And I was like, oh man, I gotta keep waiting tables if I'm, if I sell work, if I sell all the work this much, which I won't, all, all the work this month, which I probably wouldn't, I would still not cover my rent, you know? And so somewhere in there, you know, the prints made sense. And somewhere in there, when I've discovered festivals as an option, and art fairs, art festivals, you know, I was, it gave me my, my power back. It gave me control of my own destiny. I didn't have to wait for someone else. I didn't have to hope someone else could tell my story the way I knew I could tell my story. And also like, it's in, it's, it's a grind and it's a hustle and it's not for everybody and it's, it'll burn you out and all those things. But 
there is no replacement for meeting your own audience, you know, and them meeting you. People want to meet the artist, but from a pure like growth standpoint, you know, you're doing market research by learning what the, how the, even just seeing the look on someone's face when they see your work, you don't get that if your work is being sold out of your site, you know, just seeing for me, when I see the smile on people's faces, that's like, it's golden and it keeps me going and it, I know I'm doing the right thing. And you get a chance to see other cities, you get a chance to meet other people in the country, you get a chance to broaden your own perspective, which will inherently make you a better artist. You get a chance to meet other artists. You know, I've met people whose artwork just, even if their style was different, just made sense to me. And then when I talked to them, we were like the same type of person. You know, it's, it's such a fun way to meet artists from other states that you never would come across if it wasn't for that. I remember getting out of art school and somebody explaining to me that galleries take 50% and that, mm -hmm. okay, if you make, sell $30,000 worth of art within a year, you only get the half of that and going, yeah whoa, uh, what, you know, what, what have I gotten into? Um, yeah. But I've now been the director of a gallery for 14 yeah. years. So flash forward 14 years, I absolutely understand where that 50% goes. Galleries uh, keeping the lights on, they're promoting the work. But still, you have to, if, if you're going to be a working artist, that's kind of what goes into it. And yes. some artists are better business people than others. I've, I've, sure got a number of friends like you that are really great with the business side and are really great actually meeting with people and not not everybody has that so sometimes the the gallery partnership is uh, most crucial and other times it's not i mean one if you have representation at a gallery then you don't have to go through the trouble of packing your van up and driving all over the country the way i do you know it's it's there's definite definite advantages and I totally understand where the, the other 50% goes. I admire, it's funny, there's there's a, a thing where I admire artists that are gallery represented that are that have a really good relationship with a gallery and they focus on their art. Oftentimes they ask me what it's like to do what I'm doing and it's kind of, there's, um, they're both, there's, there's so much, I think there's so much, there's so many pros but different pros for each way. Um, I think what it really boils down to in terms of working with a gallery is working with the right gallery. I yeah. think a lot of young Absolutely. artists, any gallery wants to work with them and they're just on board. So yeah. if you're working with a gallery, I mean, you, you've got a, it's a relationship and it's a long term Absolutely. relationship. Yes. And that's how I approach um, starting anything with any artist is this mm -hmm. is not just, you know, this is a long term relationship. What is it? Mm -hmm like to work with this person yes. i mean first of all i've got to love their artwork but then what is yes. it like to work with this person yeah. um, if you get and the you, right person championing championing your work then yeah. it's a great thing but if you end up with a gallery with a weird contract in your works in the back room collecting dust it's not really yeah. doing anybody any good yes so. exactly and i i feel like you curate work really well i mean i haven't had the pleasure of going into photo eye in a long time, but um, I do remember every time I went to your shows, I was just floored. I don't know if you remember how much I was like drooling over some of the the photographs in that space, but yeah, you guys, and it seems like you have, you work with a lot of the, the same artists for, you know, over a long period of time, yeah? Yeah, there's about 30 artists that we represent permanently, or not permanently, that we have a long-term relationship with. And, you know, we're always forming relationships with new artists. There's only so many artists that we can keep in the physical gallery, but there's additional works we show on the website as well. Yeah, it's, it's really just kind of that connection and from from gallery to gallery and person to person, you know, maybe I'm the perfect gallerist for some artists, but not others. I mean, it's just like, like any other relationship you're forming. Yeah. Well, and you guys have had staying power over there, yeah? Mm -hmm. How long? How how long has it been around? Forty years. Forty, 40 years. years. Wow, that's that's impressive. Yeah. So that's um, that's our owner, and I mean, I've been with them for for fourteen years, not yeah. forty, but um, it's it's been a minute. And I came in as an artist myself and, and found my artistry to just be on that side of things. I'm always making, creating, whether that be cooking, gardening, or, or starting a YouTube channel. Apparently that's just what I've, I'm driven to do. 
before I worked at the gallery, when I was a kid, I was always putting on talent shows and carnivals. Okay. Back when I was in the service industry, I rented a big warehouse on Airport Road and created this art show called uh, A Night of Art and Music, which oh, I was real? actually thinking about this morning is maybe like um like a one night version of what Art in the Raw is now. <laughs> really? When was this? Or what era was this? Uh, it was in the early 2000s, I want to say. I invited, I rented a warehouse for one night. I invited 14 artists to show their work. I had some friends that were DJs that came out and spun some records. There was some live music. I had a friend who's a professional lighting designer. She did all the light design nice. the show, and then we had to take it down at the end of the night. But I just did crazy things like that because apparently I can't help it. So <laughs> that's awesome. And how and how long were those going on for? That that was that particular show was a one night thing. Okay. But we you know we went as far as making cards and mailing them to people and no shit. Okay. And then a few years later I started working at the gallery. So Okay. Do you uh, feel like you'd bring it back like an art in the raw warehouse party post COVID? It, it could happen. And, and actually, um, the name Art in the Raw comes from these art shows we had when I was in college. I've, I've borrowed it, where um, everybody would show unfinished work. Oh, kind of like a, um, what do you call it, a critique? It, it was more, it was like, it was like kind of somewhere in between a critique and a party. Oh, but you were displaying the work, right? You were yeah, displaying yeah. the work. Yeah, so okay. it was like, it was like, like a, it was like almost the warehouse format, but like you could bring half finished paintings, you could work on the paintings in the middle of the show. People would skateboard mm -hmm. through the middle of the show. It would be like an all day thing. And um, it was just a cool event. And I started conceiving of Art in the Raw probably early in March. Um, and I spent a few months trying to figure out what the show was called and it just kind of hit me one day, but yeah. And you had to bring it back to that art in the raw. Yeah. And we're in the middle of it. Yeah. Right now in the raw. So in the raw writing with lots of different types of artists. So mm -hmm. while photography's mm -hmm. the medium I'm the most versed in. And, and that was a thing I thought about early on. I thought, okay, is this just going to be visual arts? But I've, I've already expanded it into music I don't want to jinx some some episodes I'm already planning on having, so I'm not going to mention those quite yet. But basically just talking to creative people and just realizing I know a lot of really cool creative people and I want to, I want to introduce them to people. Nice. And in this weird world, I can't just have a cocktail party and introduce everybody. Right. So, so you're uh, bringing this all to the we're doing this and then even, party even, even even in a normal world folks i'm talking to are all over the country so yeah we couldn't even do that then so anyways it's it's fluid and and we'll we'll see what happens to it but um all right but and and i'm not gonna share with people right now but we've already made plans for the 40th episode yes big yeah. things in store for the 40th episode Thanks, Michael. I said 40th. Not. 40th. Yes. <laughs> We're locked in. Yeah. Sorry. I'm excited. We talked about it privately, but now it's been recorded. So. Yeah. It's Hopefully that'll fun. come soon. Yeah. <laughs> Going back, you do yeah. art fairs, but also kind of festival style fairs with music versus just art art fairs. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a different yeah. crowd. Maybe. Different crowd. Yeah. I like uh i've liked doing music festivals i think in the beginning i was trying everything i tried um art and wine festivals uh tattoo conventions i did a motorcycle rally once very bad idea and then i was like because i was just trying to think of all the different places people would buy art and music festivals came up and i think the first one i did was bonnaroo i'm not sure if i did the taos solar music festival before bonnaroo but somewhere around that air i probably did taos first then applied to Bonnaroo, couldn't believe I got in, and that blew my, that just changed my life. It blew my mind. First of all, having your uh, trade and kind of like creative pursuits be your ticket to seeing like musicians that you've wanted to see your whole life and checking things off your bucket list was like something else. How do you even and stay in your booth? Hmm? How do you even stay in your booth? 
I bring a crew. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, I bring a crew. You gotta see that. Uh, yeah, I pay my people in love and tickets, t uh, entry tickets, and uh, yeah, I bring a crew of like Bonnaroo. We would have six or seven people, um, friends, uh, my girlfriend Tara, and we'd have other friends that were there too. That would you know eventually other people started getting the uh, coming you know getting their own boots, their artists that I knew. So we we'd have really big crews, and um, yeah, we could always just take turns. Many years at Bonnaroo, I'd always ask to be have my booth near the main stage so I could just see the headliners from my booth. Like, you made way less money, but I just wanted to see the music. Mm -hmm. Who is your favorite um, musician you got to see at a, oh, at a so, uh, where you were there to sell work? Too many. Um, we saw Paul McCartney do a, a sound check. Yeah, I'll name a few. Uh, we saw uh, Paul McCartney do a sound check. And there was like 80 of us and he was just jamming on stage for like an hour while I was sitting at my booth. That was just dumb. It was, it was so good. Um, Rodrigo and Gabriela uh, were electrifying. Um, Billy Joel with everybody singing Piano Man at the same time. Yeah. Paul McCartney with everybody singing, um, yeah, everybody singing Hey Jude at the same time. Like those are just goosebump moments. Um, Anderson Pack. At a festival is just, I don't know how that man has as much energy as he does, but he wears the crowd out. I love seeing the roots. Yeah, just, it goes on. And yeah. I'm probably, I'm forgetting, I'm on the spot. I'm forgetting, uh, like, right when we're signing off, I'll be like, oh, yeah, that's, I remember now. Episode 40, you can mention the other. Episode 40, yeah. I have 32 episodes to remember. Yes. <laughs> um, so now that you're not doing the fairs and festivals, are you relying heavily on social media and your website? Mm -hmm. and uh, social media, website, and direct sales. You know, I think my, the COVID and the kind of the lockdown happened at the right time in my career where, where I was ready for a break, but also I feel like I got to the point where I could slow things down. You know, I, I had developed enough of my own client following and social media following where, and just like, you know, web traffic in general to where um, I could function independently. And it's, it's I mean, it's, it's slowed down for sure. My, my expenses are also way lower now that I'm not traveling, buying as many materials, going to, you know, going to hotels, booth fees, all those things. So, um, so my expenses are way down, so I need less. But yeah, I, I think this all happened kind of at the right time for me. And I'm beyond thankful for that. Like I'm, yeah. yeah. Crazy world right now. But crazy world we live in yeah i for one am trying to focus on the on the positive i'm not yeah i'm not trying to ignore everything that's going on but i just figure keep, keep it even you know not not ignore the world yeah. but uh focus yeah. on the positive what's, what's i mean great yeah yeah i mean stuff's happening and disastrous stuff is happening but if that's your only focus then you know if that's our only focus you know right because there's incredible things happening at the same time you know we and i i know other artists who are thriving i know i know people in other industries who are thriving many of whom were just in the right place at the right time or you know there's some for all the businesses that are getting like rocked during covid there's other ones who are it's it's a good fit for the times are a good fit for their business model you know and so i think there's both happening now and and personally it feels like it can be a disservice to overlook all the that sometimes I feel like the good stuff that happens gets overlooked. Sure. sure. Like the success, the success stories and right. You know, you're, you're not yeah. seeing as much of that in the yeah. mainstream media from what you're I not seeing it in the mainstream media. Yeah, that's what I was driving at. You know, especially when you know up until July when that you know government was assistance was going out. I saw some you know aspiring creatives the chance to not have to work their shifts and then do their art on the side. Like it was their first time that they really got to give as much energy as they had to their art first or their creative side first. And, you know, I've heard some people say, and I, I, I think it's possible that there could be a, that there will be like an artistic renaissance following all of this. And, you know, I think it's, I'd like to at the very least lean into that being the, the, the reality. I think that happened after the, what was it, the 1918 plague? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did. It was just kind of one or, of the things. I think it did, yeah. That's, um, yeah, I don't know if my notes, but, um, tends to be that kind of reaction where we go yeah we're resilient 
So we are resilient. Mm -hmm. We are resilient and we're a creative peoples and you know, you give us enough time and energy to like reprioritize our own experiences in life before we have to, uh, you know, punch in and, and pay the bills. Like people have a lot to offer and I love seeing, I mean, you know, during this whole period where people were doing the gardening and then the bread and all that, you know, people were practicing the things that they didn't even like non people who wouldn't declare themselves artists or creatives, you know, we're picking stuff up and that's like music to my ears, you know, just, just seeing people pursuing their own souls, like is, 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 is a world I'd, yeah, you're going, what's I, I would very much like to be I part of, to, um, what I, have I not had time for all of that? Yeah. I've got some of your images that I'd like. Oh to yeah. Share. Let's check so, those out. Let's, let's see what we have. Those up, see what you've got to, to say about them. Uh -huh. Are you seeing your elephant? I'm seeing my elephant. Yeah. It's called Always. So tell us about the elephant. Oh, man. Uh, it's one of my favorite pieces. It's called Always, and she is a uh, Dia de los Muertos painted elephant. So it often gets mistaken for uh, an Indian elephant, you know, with their kind of parade uh, paint, but it's, it's a, an African elephant with Day of the Dead makeup and it's it's a piece about uh it's a celebration of life and remembering those we've lost you know elephants have as everybody knows the long memories um they they're known to you know they mourn their ancestors they take their young to the burial grounds and the boneyards and and the young show reverence for ancestors they've never even met it's such a cool thing to to witness in their not that i witnessed in person but it's such a cool thing to observe in the in animal kingdom so it just felt like the Day of the Dead theme with the elephant kind of landed that point home for me. And, and then, um, you know, hummingbirds, you know, I've heard after doing my first hummingbird uh, about a decade ago, I've dozens of people from, if not hundreds from all over have shared a story about after losing somebody, a hummingbird came and visited them or on the anniversary of losing someone, a hummingbird came flew over grandpa's favorite chair, things like that. And so I've just come to accept that, you know, hummingbirds are kind of a, a totem of, of uh, remembrance and, and lost one, loved ones. So it's kind of it's all together in this image that I'm hoping is joyous and like a celebration of life. It feels that way to me. Do you, do you still have the original? I do not. Um, believe it or not, it's my favorite piece, and one of my childhood best friends ended up buying it. He's a big elephant person, and so it was uh, that kind of floored me because I was always scared of letting it go, and I guess it's, it gets to stay kind of close to the heart. That's the funny thing about making. It's like, it's like as a maker of anything, it's like it's like babies, and you don't want to. Oh yeah. Them. But then you also, as um, a businessman and an artist, you want to sell it. But then, so in this case, it went to the right person. And it's, it's weird. I feel like there's a, I mean, I feel like there's oftentimes a pull towards the right person, especially if you kind of invest your efforts in that. You know, I've had moments where maybe someone that didn't feel like the best fit for something was making a move on it and you're, you're happy to make the sale, but you, you know, you have mixed feelings and then somehow it falls apart and then the right person comes along and picks it up and you're like, ah, there it is. Meant to be. Meant to be. This one is called the paradox of vulnerability, you know, to be vulnerable is both to be, you know, susceptible to danger or, you know, a, an attack. So you want to protect yourself, but also it's important to be vulnerable in order to connect with people and to be seen and to be expressed. And so there's a line that you walk with that. And it's also kind of a word that's used in different ways. And, and because of that, it's, it can either be thought of as like a negative trait for someone to have or a positive trait for someone to have, you know? And so it's just, it's all the different things. And I thought of it as a paradox and I wanted to show that feeling as an image. And so, yeah, the snow leopard, they're amazing hunters, you know, with their paws, they can, you can't even hear them and, and they sneak up and, and they're also endangered and there's not many of them left. And it's such a weird thing for a powerful thing to be on the brink, you know, such a powerful creature to be on the brink. And then those, those flowers, those, those black, Dime, they're black diamond Lenten roses, and they are poisonous if eaten in large quantities, which is such a weird thing. I don't know who's going to eat a large quantity <laughs> of roses. 
but at least it would kind of fit the theme for me where something so beautiful could also be dangerous. Find that, you know, in, in life and love and in relationships, that is a, a hard line for people to walk. You know, if you've been hurt, then it's hard to let someone else in. But you, in order to thrive, you have to let someone in. So you have to be strong and be vulnerable while, while also protecting your vulnerabilities. It's kind of such a, it's such a lived in dynamic. I wanted to do something about it. I hope she won't. But the dog I introduced you to earlier, she's mm -hmm. famous for eating large quantities of weird things. So if you were asking oh. who would eat um, enough of these flowers to be toxic, she would do it. She would do it. She's, she's lovely, but she's crazy. <laughs> well, she actually ate yeah. 60, 60 or more fish oil pills a few months ago. No way. It was bad. It was, was, her, was her coat fabulous after that? Yes. Her, her, yeah. her coat is very fabulous now, but she's yeah. a little smelly for a minute. So. Oh, man. <laughs> so, so your, your whale. Yeah. Your whale. Okay, this one, song catcher. It's a whale flying or floating or swimming in a bed of succulents. And it's kind of song catcher. It's about, it's kind of an ode to my creativity and creativity in general and the muses in general. You know, I think as a spirit animal, I think one of the things I say about whales is it's, you know, it's, it's finding your voice, finding your song, finding your inspiration, you know, and, and I do like the idea of, you know, the song catcher, like you're not writing the song, you're catching it, you know, and, and I feel that way about, you know, the creativity as well, where it's the whole collective conscious thing. If, if, if different artists are singing the same thing from different places, you know, I, I sometimes feel like the, that piece of creativity or inspiration is pinging around and whoever catches it to share their version of it, you know, what they see. So again, looking for a way to, I was looking for a way to kind of like visually represent that. Cause I, you know, I have a lot of words for these pieces, but you get one static image to kind of display it all. It's kind of how you feel, right? Like, yeah, you know, how I feel. Yeah. And, and kind of like a, uh, like a just right, I think there's a, a phrase for this, but like a just right feeling, like a specific feeling and flavor that you want to, mm -hmm land and take someone there or at least share and and um yeah all these different elements i think and just you know the animal itself and its essence uh you know i hope i hope takes you there it seems like you tend to depict the some of the most powerful and, and uh, more interesting animals in my opinion yeah well thank you um i think i, I do some of the critters from as well i think it's just each of who knows maybe it's where i am in the in the in the queue each time I choose an animal, it's it's kind of the one that's calling them. They often tend to be ones that have a lot of gravity to them. If you notice the theme of a lot of my pieces and a lot of some of the last three that we looked at were within the last two years, some of the theme is kind of going within and listening to the voice within, you know, and kind of being in touch with your own essence and direction. So I think this is uh this one is a little bit more poised to move forward than some of the other ones. I love I love where the the wings are at. Imagine if I was a bird, kind of that point where you're just flapping the wings down, like he's getting a little extra um out of that. I don't know. I don't know what I'm yeah. talking about. But I I think I hear what you're saying. Well, I like to capture motion, and even if they're still, I like to capture motion. But just that that kinetic energy. Right. I think I've watched a lot of birds in, mm -hmm. in 2020, particularly working from home, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. kind of recognizing that that point in flight. Got, oh, I see what you're saying. I respond to it. And that's what matters. That's what matters with art. Yeah. Well, like, that point, I feel, especially if they're, if, if you're talking about like a mid flap, although he might be, I don't remember, he, he might be soaring, but even just that, that downward stroke, you know, there's so much power in that, you know, when you see them just yeah. like that, the effort they're exerting before they get to just mm -hmm. be up there and, you know, and catch the drifts. Um, it's such, I, I love watching it myself. What other art forms are you inspired by? Music, movies, other mediums, what? Yeah, um, music a lot. I vibe off of me. Music takes me to my, mm -hmm. kind of my zone if I listen to the right thing. You know what's weird is when I, when I see a really good show and I go to a lot of live music, I sometimes zone out and start thinking about my art or even sometimes think about rearranging my room, but when someone else is at the putting out their creative vibes, it's just, it's so, it's contagious to me. Like I start, it's just my, I just start wandering off into like that creative space on the spot. And I sometimes want to get home and, and jot something down or like I get inspired to create again. So music I'd put at the top of that list, you know, love movies, you know, I'm a sucker for like really good framing and composition, you know, just, just like how 
beautiful is when they can tell a story or it's engaging and they've nailed down the the look of it you know it's just again it just takes me to those like do you have a favorite movie or a favorite director oh man uh kind of like music there's not a top i like i like all kinds i mean a princess bride is like yes you just can't not love that feel good about that but i wouldn't ever say it was better or worse than another movie it's just it's what it is it's it's the princess bride and I like movies from different eras, too. I've always liked, I like The Hustler, uh, Paul Newman, the old black and white one. I really like Summer of Sam, Spike Lee, Summer of Sam. Yeah. And it's kind of like an offbeat movie, but that's one of those ways where if someone else really likes Summer of Sam, I know we can vibe. Like, it's, I, I feel like it sounds weird to say that, but. I hear you. We got a lot in it, yeah. How about collecting? Do you collect anything? Yeah, uh, I collect, collect art when I can. Space is an issue, but I collect art collect records i like books i like art books i collect friends i collect good people i'd like to have a, like a good high top shelf liquor collection but I end up always just having like one good one and it sits there forever so i don't bother getting more <laughs> um, the people books music art of all the places you've ever traveled near or far do you have a favorite oh man lots uh i lived in japan for a little bit and that cracked my head open. I mean, that really taught me uh, just how to be, taught me about who I am as a person. I took a trip down to Peru and had an experience with a hummingbird down there and kind of also had my head cracked open and, and, and learned about kind of where I understood how I was going to pattern my life. I think people go down there for like a, a pilgrimage or a vision or something, you know, just to get in touch with something and whatever that was, I found it and it was yeah, it kind of modeled the way I wanted to move forward. It's, um, and within the States, I like Austin, Texas a ton. Uh, have you been? Austin? I haven't, yeah. but I've always yeah. wanted to go see music there. Yeah, that's a special town and uh, music everywhere. Um, New Orleans is amazing um, and kind of... I've been to New Orleans. I love New Orleans. You've been to New Orleans, yeah. yeah. Special town, right? Music as well. Yeah. Food as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wander around waiting to hear music and then follow it. Yeah. yeah. I did. Um, yeah, and it's not hard to find at any, at any time. <laughs> right, in New Orleans. It's true. Yeah, yeah. So when we can travel again, do you mm -hmm. have the first place on your list where you're going? I had a trip to Hawaii with a good friend of mine. We were going to stay with a good friend out there and mm -hmm. do this, like, backpacking trip on the coast um, in Kauai. Every year in the spring, I'm getting ready for festivals and shows and it's really freaking a lot of work. And so this year I was like, we can't pull this trip off. We got to postpone it. Yeah. It was about a week before everything went down. <laughs> like we would have, so we would have gotten back like a week before everything went down. So I had no idea. I backed out at the time of the, um, the last epic trip of the pre COVID world. And so that trip needs to be done. I just don't know when we get to do it. I think it'll happen. Just maybe not. Uh, yeah. Tomorrow. <laughs> not, not tomorrow. Not tomorrow. I really want to do that. We're going to hike the coast and try to sleep in caves and, or in, yeah, in caves and stuff. And Sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. I got egg on my face for that one. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw up your Instagram page. Let's do it. Here. Roner Art. You've got this video you posted. Recently. Yeah. Should I pop that up? Let's pop it up. Yeah. The Lotus. So a little process here. Yeah. I'm trying to do more of these process videos because it's kind of, I want to be in my own space when I'm doing it. And then you got to get the camera set up and all that. So I, I push myself to do more of them because I, I could just as easily lose myself in it there. But yeah, here's a process of uh, adding some watercolor and gouache to this Lotus flower. That's an accoutrement of the, Wolf and Raven piece I've been working on a lot of this during this time. And yeah, it's like one of my finishing touches on this, on this piece that I'm really excited about. Is this your dog? I mean, this That's my dog. That's Kimchi. Great name. So, I mean, I was just kind of looking back and forth between this wolf and your dog just prior to talking. And I don't know, maybe that's like your dog in the dream world or, you know, or, I mean, that's the thing about art that's so cool is you can interpret it in your own way. And you know what's wild is uh, there's definitely kimchi vibes in that wolf. Um, I've actually 
had that wolf in the back burner for a long, like for years. And, and we've had kimchi for about a year, but I wouldn't, you know, her, her face and look is like, helped me bring it to life. Just, just seeing kimchi's face every day and then working on the wolf. It, I don't know, it's in there somehow. I, I think I'm better. That wolf is better for having kimchi near it. I could see that. Definitely. And then let's see here. You kind of got an idea of the scale of some of these pieces. I feel like there's some canvases in here, like these, like these are yeah. some kind of awesome, tiny little canvases here. Yeah, I do these little minis. Those are, um, are they small original? paper illustrations. Those are originals and they're mounted to, they're small paper originals, uh, illustrations mounted to wood panel. Mm -hmm. um, and those are like five by sevens, I think. Yeah, those are five by sevens. So I try to do the, the minis to kind of, offer a variety since my originals tend to be really big no and then they're kind of because they're canvases they're ready to hang ready to hang yeah yeah they're on my site under if you go to my website ronerart.com um under uh gallery i think and then mini 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 totems and you'll see the ones that i have available they're yeah, ready to hang and then you do these great little photos on your instagram from your various booths oh yeah how great is that little deacon that kid was cool yeah there was this little uh young collectors program at the show where you donated work and made it available for like young kids to spend their little art bucks there and apparently deacon like went straight to my tiger and then told his parents wanted to go to my booth so yeah we got to meet and hang out for a little bit he was a cool kid i love that yeah i love that and then your cat is this your cat here it's my cat yeah Likes to call it also. Oh, and so this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. I was talking about the outlines and the processes. I mean, mm -hmm. this could be not a sketch for a tattoo, but I mean, this could be the actual outline of a tattoo. Yeah, uh, I hear that from a lot of people and um, people get my work tattooed on them. Sometimes I get folks asking me to design tattoos for them, but more more often someone will pop up and or send me a message and saying they got you know they my work well they got my work on their their body and um and it's just i think it's i guess it's uh i guess i have a tattooish style have you ever thought about tattooing i mean there's a lot of talented tattooers out there there are now so yeah. i think if you're not yeah um i get encouraged to do that a lot i think that's the, maybe that's what i was trying to say when people were comment a lot they're like you should do tattoos or do you do tattoos yourself and um I think for me I I like that if I make a mistake on paper I can, <laughs> can yeah. yeah there you go a couple people there's a tattoo yeah of your work yeah, yeah. my crow that artist did a good job so maybe you will like, see your the designs field. in the tattoo shop but we probably won't see you in the tattoo shop yeah I'd say yeah. so yeah <laughs> yeah, the name of the game for me is drawing what I feel like drawing in the moment, and it's uh, uh, it's been painstaking to make that happen. So I kind of don't, I'm, I'm, I don't want to relinquish it. So I was just looking for this little beer label that. Oh yeah, so that was fun. Yeah, do you still do? Are you doing illustrations? Yeah, I actually need to get back in touch with them. Um, that was a one-off. Yeah, I actually, I really like their beer. And they're in Sparks, Nevada, passed through with uh, my lady, Tara, and that was kind of, it was on the way, so she was like, we can drive there and stop off there, and, and then she'll drive the rest of the way, since she knew I'd, like, sample their wares, um, and got inside their tap room, and with all the art they had on the walls and their bottles, she's like, man, your art, your art would really fit well on these bottles, and I was like, yeah, yeah, so I, uh, great girlfriend. <laughs> yes great she's a, she's awesome and um so i ran to my van grabbed a bunch of stickers gave it to the bartender and was like is the you know can you give these to the owner and like sure and then um apparently we left and drove and had no reception and when i got out i had a voicemail and it was like come back are you still here but we missed them so we on the phone and and like started talking about doing stuff so i was i was blown away that my favorite one of my favorite breweries i got to do work for I'm and, uh, reading here that's an 11% beer, so. That's an 11% beer, which that's, I'm. That's about a barley wine. 
That's yeah, pretty much. I take it as a badge of honor. They go, they go really hoppy. I mean, that's a triple, right? Yeah, it's a triple. Definitely an honor. Oh, so I think they have a location in Berkeley. Uh, got to do a shout out. Do you know Drake's? They've got one. In yeah, Oakland. yeah, they're in um, San Leandro and Oakland, I believe. Yeah. So, so my my girl, uh, the city, Gina Kikorian, her her family owns that brewery. No shit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, last time I visited her in the Bay Area, we went by her dad's house, and um, he had some twenty-two ounces from Drake's. They do the denogonizer, I think. Is that the Drake's? I, you know, I don't remember. I think it was an IPA or a stout. This was years ago, but they're 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 doing some great beers and yeah. They're Next quite time delicious. I'm in Berkeley, we'll definitely have to go by and. Um, yeah, I like that. Yeah, if uh, if you make it during a COVID year, you you gotta link up. For sure, for sure. I don't know if I'll make it. Quite, well, who knows? But I I love the West Coast. I love California. I love living in New Mexico. I'm mm -hmm, mm -hmm. definitely not leaving New Mexico anytime soon. But uh, guaranteed, I'll definitely be back to the West yeah. Coast. Yeah. So yeah, they're a good compliment. I found, you know, a lot of people who moved from just New it. Mexico and Albuquerque land in Oakland. I think there's a lot of compatibility in the cultures. Uh, go back to that last one, if you don't mind. Oh, the, the booth? This one? Yeah, you yeah. just landed on one since we're talking about beer. I did Oktoberfest in Oakland, and that's a fun uh -oh, one. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, all the local bro local breweries and all that, yeah, I just happened to, to land there. And yeah, I think, yeah, I was next to the Raiderettes booth, so... Um, people came for taking pictures with cheerleaders and they left with the art. <laughs> this one over here, this triptych with the bird. Yeah. I love yeah. that one. Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, that's an earlier. Indian condor. I was like, I remember that one. Yeah, I think I, I think I was living out, I, I did it while I was in Santa Fe. I think so. That yeah. Seems about right. So yeah, I mean like here's another kind of festival. Oh well, I don't oh know, yeah, your booth. You're just enjoying. That was the stage. Yeah, that was the uh, view from my booth. You know, we talked about that was a yoga festival, Wonderlust. Oh, cool. uh, which ended up being a really good fit. So yeah, I was like that close. That was like right in front of my booth. I was by the stage. Good deal. Well, so check out the Instagram page, and you have That's a me. website as well. Ronerart.com check it out. Oh, and you have an email newsletter as well. Yeah, please sign up for that. It's there's a sign up on my on my website front page. I think the top or bottom, you'll find it. Do you have any shout outs? Anything you want to anything you got to say? So, I've been working on this Wolf and Raven piece with the newly added Lotus for a long time and I'm excited about it. So, keep an eye out for it. It's coming out soon. I'm putting the finishing touches and I've been able to work on it at my own pace for the first time since I started this whole dang thing. And like beyond excited to get it out there and, and share it. So keep an eye out for that. Either follow me on the Instagram or sign up for my newsletter and you'll see it when it comes out. Get your newsletter and I follow you. So I'll, yeah, I'll you just, for it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for joining tonight. It's been fun catch up and and we've made future plans so we made future plans thank you for having me if you enjoyed this conversation go back check out episodes one through six please like comment and subscribe and also follow art in the raw on instagram and facebook yes. and look forward to seeing you next week and thanks again michael thank you and have Bye. a great night you too